Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Chapter 2 The First Sun Sand Packing Of course, one can imagine what sort of father and mentor such a man would be. As a father, he did precisely what was expected of him, that is, he totally and utterly abandoned his child by Adelaide Ivanovna. Not out of malice towards him, or not from any wounded matrimonial feelings, but simply because he totally forgot about him. While he was pestering everyone with his tears and complaints and turning his house into an inquitious den, a faithful family servant, Grigory, took the three-year-old Mitya into his care, and if Grigory had not looked after him then, there would perhaps have been no one to change the child's shirt. Moreover, it so happened that the child's relatives on his mother's side also seemed to forget about him at first. His grandfather, that is, Mr. Muse of himself, the father of Adelaide Ivanovna, was no longer living. His widow, Mitya's grandmother, had moved to Moscow and was quite ill, and the sisters were all married so that Mitya had to spend almost a whole year with the servant Grigori, living in the servant's cottage. But even if his papa had remembered him, indeed he could not have been unaware of his existence, he would have sent him back to the cottage, for the child would have gotten in the way of his debaucheries. Just then, however, the late Adelaide Ivanovna's cousin, Pyotr Alexandrovich Musev, happened to return from Paris. Afterwards, he lived abroad for many years, but at the time he was still a very young man, and among the Musevs an unusual sort of man, enlightened, metropolitan, cosmopolitan, a lifelong European, and at the end of his life a liberal of the forties and fifties. In the course of his career he had relations with many of the most liberal people of his epoch, both in Russia and abroad, he knew Proudhon and Bakunin personally, and he particularly liked to recall and describe, this was already near his journey's end, the three days of the February Revolution in Paris in 48, letting on that he himself had almost taken part in it on the barricades. This was one of the most delightful memories of his youth. He had independent property, valued according to the old system at about a thousand souls. His splendid estate lay just beyond our little town and bordered on the lands of our famous monastery, with which Pyotr Alexandrovich, while still very young, having just come into his inheritance, at once began endless litigation over the right to some kind of fishing in the river or woodcutting in the forest. I'm not sure which, but to start a lawsuit against the clericals was something he even considered his civic and enlightened duty. Hearing all about the Delaide Ivanovna, whom he of course remembered, and had once even shown some interest in, and learning of Mita's existence, he decided, despite his youthful indignation and his contempt for Fyodor Pavlovich, to step into the affair. It was then that he first made the acquaintance of Fyodor Pavlovich. He told him straight off that he wanted to take responsibility for the child's upbringing. Years later he used to recall, as typical of the man, that when he first began speaking about media with Fyodor Pavlovich, the latter looked for a while as if he had no idea what child it was all about, and was even surprised, as it were, to learn that he had a little son somewhere in the house. Though Pyotr Alexandrovich may have exaggerated, still, there must have been some semblance of truth in his story. But all his life, as a matter of fact, Fyodor Pavlovich was fond of play-acting, of suddenly taking up some unexpected role right in front of you, often when there was no need for it, and even to his own real disadvantage as for instance in the present case. 
This trait, however, is characteristic of a great many people, even rather intelligent ones, and not only of Pyotr Pavlovich. Pyotr Alexandrovich hotly pursued the business and even got himself appointed the child's guardian, jointly with Pyotr Pavlovich, since there was, after all, a small property, a house and estate left by his mother. Mitya did, in fact, go to live with his mother's cousin, but the latter, having no family of his own and being in a hurry to return to Paris for a long stay, as soon as he had arranged and secured the income for his estates, entrusted the child to one of his mother's cousins, a Moscow lady. In the event, having settled himself in Paris, he too forgot about the child, especially after the outbreak of the above-mentioned February Revolution, which so struck his imagination that he was unable to forget it for the rest of his life. The Moscow lady died, and Mitya was passed on to one of her married daughters. It seemed he later changed homes for a fourth time. I won't go into that now, particularly as I shall have much to say later on about the first-born son of Fyodor Pavlovich, and must confine myself here to the most essential facts, without which I could not even begin my novel. First of all, this Dmitri Fyodorovich was the only one of Fyodor Pavlovich's three sons who grew up in the conviction that he had at least some property and would be independent when he came of age. He spent a disorderly adolescence and youth. He never finished high school. Later he landed in some military school, then turned up in the Caucasus, was promoted for the duel, was broken to the ranks, promoted again, led a wild life, and spent comparatively a great deal of money. He received nothing from Fyodor Pavlovich before his coming of age, and until then ran into depth. He saw and got to know his father, Fyodor Pavlovich, for the first time only after his coming of age when he arrived in our parts with the purpose of settling the question of his property with him. It seems that even then he did not like his parent. He stayed only a short time with him and left quickly, as soon as he had managed to obtain a certain sum from him and made a certain deal with him concerning future payments from the estate. Without a fact worth noting, being able to learn from his father either the value of the estate or its yearly income. Fyodor Pavlovich saw at once, and this must be remembered, that Mitya had a false and inflated idea of his property. Fyodor Pavlovich was quite pleased with this, as it suited his own designs. He simply concluded that the young man was frivolous, wild, passionate, impatient, a cruiser who, if he could snatch a little something for a time, would immediately calm down, though of course not for long. And this Fyodor Pavlovich began to exploit, that is, he fobbed him off with some small sums, with short-term handouts until after four years, Mitya, having run out of patience, came to our town a second time to finish his affairs with his parent, when it suddenly turned out to his great amazement that he already had precisely nothing, that this was impossible even to get an accounting, that he had already received the whole value of his property in cash from Fyodor Pavlovich, and might even be in debt to him, that in terms of such and such deals that he himself had freely entered into on such and such dates, he had no right to demand anything more, and so on and so forth. The young man was stunned, suspected a lie or a trick, was almost beside himself, and as it were, lost all reason. This very circumstance led to the catastrophe, an account of which forms the subject of my first introductory novel, or better the external side of it. But before I go on to this novel, I must introduce the other two sons of Fyodor Pavlovich. Mitya's brothers, and explain where they came from. <laughs>